Well, it's an awful piece of crap, so maybe that's true. But that's also a myth, but people say it all the time. So, what's going on? So, if people say easy to use, I say, here, this is totally easy to use. You lie down and you relax and you have a great time. And everybody can use it. And it is awesome to use it. So, easy, too many times is the synonym of lazy. And if you want to be a 3D artist, or if you want to be in any creative profession, you have to be prepared to work. And work hard, make uh, long days, train yourself, and become really good. Because making 3D, and especially if you want to be on the edge of what's possible, because we are competing with the best of the world, the best software of the world, that means that things are not always easy. But things can be simple. And I think that's what people usually mean. <clears throat> so, when they say easy, they usually mean simple. And simple is really a different concept. When something is simple, it is usually really hard to make something simple. People who make film and say, well, I want to have a story and I want to have a plot. How do you make a simple plot? Or how do you make an interface simple to use? And simple then means that it becomes more predictable or it's consistent or it has the right small flexible building blocks which you can immediately grasp and you think, aha, I only have to learn this, this and this and then I can create a complete universe out of it. That's the, the simplicity. And I always try to get that and keep that in mind. So easy, not important. I don't mind working hard, but it should be simple. That's important. Now, so intuitive. So this is, for people who don't know, this is uh, 3D Max, which is totally intuitive, according <laughs> to most people, because it is industry standard, right? Everybody uses it. The people say, well, intuitive, I want intuitive software, they mean I want Blender to look like uh, Cinema 4D or Maya or Max or whatever. Or they talk about this. So, are you driving on the right side of the road or are you driving on the left side of the road? I mean, many things are coming down not to things that's intuitive, but it's basically conventions. So what are you used to? What is it what you have learned before? And that is what makes you uh, like or use software. <clears throat> so conventions are not bad, but it's good to understand why a convention is important to understand. So it's not about the intuition, which is some kind of a magic thing people get born with. It's about something you learn. Sometimes it is good to demand people to learn things because learn once, use everywhere. So once you know one thing in Blender, you should be able to apply the same knowledge in other areas. It's an important thing that makes it intuitive. On the other hand, what you see is people who use different types of software a lot, they might have problems to adjust from one program to another. And it is very uh, justified for them to say, I want software to adapt to me. I don't have time to adapt to other programs all the time. <clears throat> so, the crap thing. So, I couldn't find worse screenshots. I tried Googling for Blender screenshots and you get those kind of things. For people who don't know Blender, they might think, oh, too many buttons and weird things. I have no idea what this program is doing. I know what every screenshot is doing, but maybe for you it's new. But what people usually see is that the interface of Blender, especially if you load it or you try tutorials, it is very difficult to find out when it works, or when it works half, or when it works really good, or whether it was meant to work this way, or whether you are working with a bug. Because in Blender that can be dynamic, right? We release every two months and then there's a bug and then there's something working and something else breaks. 
And for us as a user, especially the new users, have no idea. Even when I start up Blender, I sometimes have no idea anymore what's going on. Like, what? What's happening here? Is this a bug? Or did a coder purposely do this? And that's what some users make, um, the way people think Blender is a piece of crap, because we do have a lot of those issues. <laughs> On the other hand, we also have really well-defined design rules and good paradigms. And I think that Scholar is good once in a while to go back to those design rules and paradigms, really look at it, remove the dust, maybe tweak it a bit or add a couple of new ones, and then build further on it and communicate it really well because if you understand what is meant to work, you can learn Blender much more efficient. Now, go back to the Blender 2.5. In 2008 or so, I think seven, the 2.5 concept popped up. And I think it was almost in a similar situation as what we are in now. Because we did have the project working, we were making 2.4, 2.4 something, and everything was like, yeah, hmm. So we are moving lots and lots of problems to the future because we can't solve them now. And that's not good. It doesn't make it a pleasant project. You see the bugs and the problems piling up, and we can't help people anymore. So we really have to stop doing this and try to go back to the drawing board and define what we want to fix, what we want to keep. If you go to uh, the wiki section, the development documentation, you can still read a lot of talks about what we did for 2.5. I don't know if people can see it, but there's uh, stuff about how the design was, or what the, the core principles are, or how the, uh, the event system is working, how the windowing system is working. So those things were actually good docs. And I think one of the reasons why we did survive this enormous project, because it took us two years to get 2.5 to a working level, was also because we really well knew where to go and how to go there. So it had a clear goal, and had a clear mission, and everybody could collaborate on it. <clears throat> so let's go looking at a couple of those original 2.5 paradigms. Some of them were already originally going back to the 90s when I was uh, designing Blender. <clears throat> the first three, yeah. non-overlapping, non-blocking, and non-modal, <coughs> so people understand this mostly, but I still want to talk a little bit about it. But non-overlapping is clear. I mean, interfaces, when they start having 20 windows everywhere, is not really helping you. It's only stopping you from working. On the other hand, the Blender interface, based on subdivisions, sometimes makes it e not easy either, because if you very rigidly only allow a subdivision, it also doesn't always work. But it's a good starting point, and then you can make users, so you give the users the freedom to pop up a window if they want to, like for a render, or a file window, or whatever. But for the rest, your interface should be a quiet screen of options which you should use. The non-blocking is more difficult to understand, but you can see this also as a non-overlapping being adopted in like every interface now. That means if you do one thing, you shouldn't be stopped from doing something else. If you move a vertex in a model, and you think, oh shit, I have to fix that bone over there, and then you paint something, and you make a note, or you work on a shader, or you set a color, in Blender, whenever you want to do something, you can. The interface shouldn't stop you from doing something. Uh, other software, especially in the 90s, decided that they have to split up in modules. So you force the developer or the, the artist to think in, okay, I'm going to model, then I'm going to uh, texture, then I'm going to animate, and when I want to go back, I have to close the software and import things in a module, and then I can go back to my uh, modeling part. But that's not what you want. And the other thing what 2.5 did really well was the fact that if you use a button, you slide values, that the interface keeps working. 
even when you start rendering, the interface is responsive. So whatever you do, the interface should stay responsive. I'm the biggest hater of progress bars. I hate progress bars. And that's not because I don't want, I don't like progress bars, but I don't like the idea of people having to wait for software. They shouldn't. Never. If you load your start or blender, it should be there. If you want to load a file, it should be there. If you want to do something, it should be there. If you want to render and you have to wait for it, we should solve that in a way that you might continue working while rendering is happening in the background. That's uh, non-blocking. Non-modal doesn't only mean that if you pop up a requester and the interface stops working, that is traditionally non-modal. Non-modal also means that you don't make a user switch their uh, usability between modes. So when you are used to click and drag and use your mouse gestures and other things in one place, it should also work in other modes. Whether you are modeling, painting, editing, whatever you do, you shouldn't be forced to rethink your way of working all the time. Sounds very logical, but a lot of software designers make that mistake. And they make even things like escape keys or clicks or middle mouse or right mouse, doesn't matter. But if you make something consistent, your, uh, the way of your working, a human way of working, becomes possible because things become second nature. You don't have to think, oh shit, I pressed a key, but I'm now in this mode, and that key means something else, as in another mode in Blender where you can use the same keys. You should try to limit that, because it's really frustrating that you cannot train yourself and get habits in software. But those concepts led to a couple of other things, like the select and then operate order in Blender is coming from this non-modal principle. Because if you know Maya, if you want to move something in Maya, you first say, I want to move. And then you go to the interface and you move stuff. And if you want to do something else, you say, I want to do something else. And then you go to the interface and you do something else. Which is very easy for people to learn. Easy again. But it's not very efficient. It stops you from working. Plus, it makes things modal. But for every tool option, what you do on the interface, gives you a different result. So you always have to think, oh shit, I'm in that mode, so what I'm doing now will give me this result. Now I have to go to another mode, and I do the same thing, and I get uh, uh, the result I want. So that makes it confusing. In Blender, we decided to split it. So you first select what you, the data you want to work on, faces, uh, vertices, objects, doesn't matter, and then you operate the tool. The second thing was, an experiment, 2.5 started doing that, that we wanted to have a fast workflow, so you should be able to operate immediate, and if you are not happy with the operation, you can redo it. You have the, the redo operating panel in Blender. That's something we could review, because it does work, but it also sometimes is very clumsy. Some people want to apply a tool with a preset. I say, okay, I want to extrude in this type, and not first do something, and then go back and tweak it, right? So this is something we could look at. I still like it. It does help you to create a fast workflow. Uh, the other thing, the separating tools from properties, I think we did that quite well. The, the whole toolbar is not finished in Blender. We should work on a real toolbar. It's still useful to have it. But I don't know if people remember in 2.4, tools and properties were mixed in the interface. So you had all the properties, the tools, and properties, and you had to find your way around where everything is. So we solved that in 2.5. Two things I added myself, it's on the wiki, but Blender is installation free. It's not an interface choice, but I hate installations. I hate a lot of things, bad things, like uh, <laughs> progress bars, but installation is even worse. The most stupid thing ever is installation, right? Why do you install software? I don't know. I, I'm, a, I'm not a programmer. I write software, but I don't know what I'm doing. But I don't want installations. That's stupid. 
Well, everybody who is in developing here, and people who is listening to this video, do not install, right? Let's agree on that, because users don't like that. I don't like it. I don't think anyone wants software to mesh with your system. So you should be able, to, and it's possible even, to plug in your USB drive with Blender in a computer and run it. That's it. That's how software should work. And the last thing, yeah, Blender is for artists. Very obvious. But there are developers who think maybe different, you know? I think, uh, well, yeah, but Blender is also for me, you know? So, now well, Blender is for artists, really. So if you develop something, if you want to make a new viewport, for example, uh, developers too easily go into the technical, oh, the APIs four point something with that kind of buffering and things. It's going to be awesome. But then where is the user? Well, where is the artist? So it's always good to have a goal in mind to say, okay, there's a user. He has a viewport. And what does the user want with the viewport? How are we going to help game designers, for example, or animators? What do they need? And then go back to the technology. But the same is for scripting. So scripting is awesome, add-ons, great, but it is there to help artists. And we don't make a scripting language for developers like Python. So, <coughs> that was the paradigms. Is it clear so far a little bit, what? <coughs> so what can we do uh, to, in this conference in the next month? Uh, yeah, uh, look at the concepts. I wouldn't mind hearing from people what they think or what, how they perceive 2.5, what they think was a good move forward, and how we can keep moving forward. What is it what we really have to do to make it and keep it working? But be realistic. I mean, coding takes time. And unfortunately, every time you want to make another step, it becomes like 10 times more complicated. And so this is the typical thing a development manager will say. If a developer says it takes two days, plan four weeks, right? And when a developer says this takes me two weeks, you can better plan four months. So you double things in an exponential way. So when somebody says four months, it's probably eight years or something. And then <laughs> don't do it, right? So that's too long. And that's not so much of a making fun of developers thing. It is because sometimes you really have to realize that making something, for example, the particle system, I was talking about it today. I think the first particle system I coded in a, in a week that's the Blender particle system before Jana called it a decent system for Big Bug Bunny. And that was several months of work and full time. It took him a year, but two months of full time work. And then for the last the Gooseberry project, we tried to make a new particle system which would have everything we want. And then we decided, yeah, but it would, that would take us too much work. We cannot do it even in two years. Right? Or maybe with two people full-time, two years, we would be able to handle this complexity. So this is typical in, in every company. Uh, if you talk to uh, uh, software development companies, they know that when you want to move up, you sometimes have to triple your team and double the amount of time to do it. Same is for us. If you want to get amazing, awesome software with lots of features, yeah. But do we have the people and the time and the money to do it? So let's try to keep things feasible. For example, a complete new data design, which is uh, possible for Blender, which would completely change everything. Maybe wait with that. There's a couple of other things. If you say, well, if you want to really redo all of those things, then the time to survive it will be so long that we won't do this, it won't help us. Yeah, and then we have a couple of unfinished 2.5 tasks, tasks which we have to do. We can talk about that, like configura think configurability. But I come back to that. So, <clears throat> this is why I thought, okay, let's start a 
2.8 project. I mentioned it this morning because I saw that the main and the key developers of Blender were a little bit complaining and bugs and it was a review and another bug and another release. It was getting boring a bit, but also they didn't have time to do anything they really wanted. It was only maintenance and the little cycles of making Blender a little bit better, a little bit better. I mean, it is really good. It's very stable, very proud of what we do, but it didn't feel exciting anymore. There was not so much interest or vision anymore. There was a little lack of direction and also, I think, a lack of empowerment because nobody knows who decides things. That's really true. But a lot of people are empowered, but it is difficult to make decisions, especially if you have to be compatible all the time. You have to drag like 15 years of history with you in Brandel, and every step you do has to be compatible with like a thousand other things, which is not very efficient. So, that's what I thought. Coding holidays. So the developers now can, can cheer and say hooray and stuff. Where are the developers? <laughs> so yeah, they don't believe it yet probably. They think, oh my God, we have to do all of that to get coding holidays? I mean, I, I thought holidays was meant to be fun and relaxing, right? <laughs> well, it is. I mean, that's how we'll try to make sure that the developers will have a fun and relaxing time. So the coding holidays, I mean, that's what I did when I wanted to do something big. I shipped myself to a little island somewhere without internet. And then after a week, I get bored, really bored. And then I start coding. That's how you, how you do it. And if you get distracted all the time, it's impossible to do big things. So I hope that uh, to, like, you don't shut down the bug tracker, but... Uh, you, mentally, you could shut down the bug tracker and don't look at all those discussions anymore, but give developers, uh, the people in our team, months, I don't mind how long, but to give them time to think and think and rethink and get bored a bit again that they feel like, okay, now I can do something bigger. So, that's the workflow thing. So why workflow? I mean, one is, of course, marketing, because who is against workflow? Anyone? What? You dare to be against workflow? No, that's not possible. Workflow is a great marketing and a great term to get people excited because everybody wants workflow. <laughs> right? Yes, yeah. well, I thought so. So workflow is, is hip and cool in the marketing of other 3D software. If you look at well, Max and Maya and other guys, they don't talk about features anymore because everybody has uh, cycle style renderings and the uh, open subdiv and uh, well, all the new viewports and all the things. Software is almost finished. People, it seems like as if the software is done, they can do millions and billions of polygons and nobody expects you to do even more polygons. So what people focus on is workflow because workflow counts. And workflow is not a bad thing because workflow is about uh, what starts in the morning and what you have at the end of a day, or what starts at the beginning of a project, and then you end up with something. And you want to go from A to B in the most efficient and fun way. You have pleasure, it's efficient, it's inspiring, and the tools have to work with you. That is good workflow. I think the workflow theme will help us to tackle a number of targets in London. And I, I think we can limit it to six. The six key topics which will help with people's workflow. So that's the viewport. People understand the viewport. Talk about that. Uh, the interface uh, tools and configurability topic. That is uh, ob object modifier physics. The everything notes thing. We can probably not do everything, but we should have more notes. Uh, there's the asset management and pipelines, the logic editor, because there's still people making games with Blender, and don't forget about it, and the interoperability. I go 
into one of every topic a little bit more. What does Viewport mean? The Viewport project means that we upgrade to a modern version of OpenGL, which allows uh, physically based real-time shaders, which allows you to get shader editing, uh, good node-based shader editing, which gives you Blender internal rendering quality or better, but done in real-time. This is useful for a lot of cases, but it's also useful for game artists, for example, because they can mimic the way how a model or an environment or a character will look like in a game inside of the Blender interface. We have to stop having view modes. That is stupid. We have to look at <coughs> workflow modes, like people who sculpt or who animate or who do uh, 3D painting. They all have different ways how they would like to configure. Uh, so we can also look at compositing in the interface. We have to make it balanced. Uh, compositing means even I have a real-time shadow or AO in the interface is a compositing effect. But you can also make selection as a comp compositing effect. <clears throat> you have to make sure that those things are well designed so that things are always working. <coughs> and of course, no more wireframes. Shocked. <laughs> well, why not? Well, wireframes, of course, you should have line drawing. But wireframes are the other stupidest thing from the 90s, 80s, right? Where these people think, oh, a computer interface with 3D, it has wireframes. Wow, you know? But wireframes are stupid. They were there only because we didn't have anything better than wireframe in those days. <coughs> Nowadays, you can have this, and in real time. So look, this is a uh, CAD program bought by Autodesk last year. Uh, I still don't know what they do exactly, and whether it's marketing or so, but they pretend as if they have an interface that does this in real time. And look at it here, this. So, do you need wireframes for this? If you would have wireframes for that kind of stuff, you wouldn't see anything. And this way is how you make modern interfaces. Good looking renders, but you can also combine it with outline rendering and get your solids colored in a way that you know what you are doing. So the people who designed the new viewport should think about that. They should think about, okay, so we are in 10 years time and people are using a viewport that looks like a photo realistic environment. How do you work within a realistic environment? You should be able to. You shouldn't go back to wireframe, right? Now, you can do things that make high quality viewports work for tools. <coughs> so, going back to the second topic. Tools and configurability. What does that mean? An interface topic. One, stop adding buttons. I say it every time to developers. If you add one button, you should remove two. Right? That's a, <laughs> the deal. Otherwise, we get too many. You should be able to remove buttons. But buttons are not very helpful. And if you will see the evolution of the Blender interface, eh, it's, it's like button creep. They get everywhere. And some people refuse to learn certain parts of Blender because of the buttons. And it's not uh, because we are stupid, but if you write uh, the current particle system or a f a fluid, a simulation, those buttons are like big uh, uh, airplane cockpits to control something complicated which is very nice as a first generation interface, but we have to be able to make a step further. We should be able to use a particle system or to set up a hair system without having to learn the physics equations that are behind all those things. It's not needed, right? So those things we have to rethink. Another thing is also that we have to bring back work to viewports. So why would you go to a toolbar, do something, and then fill in values, and then you go to the viewport and do things? There's a lot of new tools coming up that really focus things on working in the viewport. And in reality, things work without buttons, you see? You can do all this, you can drink, put it, and move things around. 
I don't need anything, right? I can work on it. You can work without buttons. And I think we should try to think, how can you work in the interface and create things? In the viewport, I mean. Now, we have to end the fight over shortcuts. There is no empty key anymore. I'm sorry, we're out of it. So, we have to stop. Uh, Jonathan uh, said yesterday, 95% of us it. 98%? 95. It's quite modest. Yeah. Maybe make it 98. So, but at some moment, the idea is let's not fight over every shortcut. It doesn't work. Let's try to, everything we fight over, we should not put it in any defaults or deliver it and make it a user choice. Let's do what we agree on. And let's also do something which other software do successfully. Like, for example, Maya, if you download it for the first time, it has an extreme minimal default configuration, which hardly does anything. So it forces you to go to menus and do all kinds of clumsy things to use the software, which is not bad because that allows people to have a release update and then combine it with their own presets and still have everything work. There's no conflict. Okay, good topic to talk about. Well, we have to finish the Python API. The people want to have uh, custom editors in Lambda. Which, uh, if you can imagine it, uh, I'm not going to explain what it would mean. It would mean really weird things. I can promise you that. But it's important to have it. We should allow uh, swapping interface configurations. So most of the Blender UI is defined by Python and some other files. And you should be able to say very good, high quality ways of switching interface configurations. For example, I still would like to have a project working which I call Blender 101, which is, for example, for high school kids of 12, 14 years old, a simple tool to introduce them to 3D. Maybe only 3D printing. So teachers or educators should be able to say, okay, this is Blender, and I kick out 99% of everything. I disable it even, so users, uh, if they press P, we shouldn't want to have the game engine to run for those kids. We should be able to very efficiently remove all the options, except for some of the options for uh, testing, uh, for the volume, measuring thickness and wall thickness, and uh, the stuff you want to have for 3D printing, and a couple of preset images for the big monkey, and the, or some other animals, and people can drag and drop them, and the big print button, and it goes to the printer. So how would you configure that? I think this is relevant. I think it's important for us as Blender makers, as community, and as open source community to have open source tools in education. But we can only do that if we make educators happy. And as you know, we cannot make ant educators happy and the people who make feature films. So somehow this has to become a design to swap configurations. A great example of modern tool design is what you see in Pixar Presto. And this is DreamWorks animation tool. You can Google it. This is a great video and demonstration about how DreamWorks works with uh, selections here. So it's a little solid highlight which allows, this is, which is an input uh, area for posing. So you go over the face, you see a little highlight, you move it and the guy starts smiling or whatever. So this is how you work in the interface, in the viewport, posing and animating. Plus having nice expressions, presets, and it works. So this is a visual interface which we can do too. This is not too far away from what we could have in Blender. And no wireframes, right? Good. Okay, the notes. Everybody loves notes, and notes do have problems. Uh, they're not always easy, and if you have a thousand of them, uh, you get lost. And it's like programming, you know? The smart thing of notes, I usually say, is uh, coders like it, because this is how they make the users responsible for developer. But they only have to make the little black boxes, and the users then create crap. 
And then if they say, yeah, but it doesn't work, then you say, yeah, but it's your nose system. You made it, right? The nodes are working perfect, but you made a non-working node system with it. So uh, there is a limit to it. On the other hand, nodes are also very powerful, and especially for things like hair, yeah, physics, particles, uh, lots of uh, relationships in 3D, uh, nodes will be doing great. Hair yeah, modifiers, for example, because this is how people want to use it anyway. If you see what people do with modifier stacks in Blender, it's amazing, but it's so complicated. You can do things a little bit more efficient, I think, with nodes, especially if you then allow also a nice flow that you can have data coming in, a node system getting modified and hair growing stuff, and then you send it out again. This is a little bit what Houdini does. Houdini is completely designed from scratch for this. We can't do that, but we can do at least for the modifiers of physics, hair particles. We can try to find a nice unified node system that allows uh, this whole list of things. This is already a lot. <clears throat> so we do have a little bit of this already. There are two Python scripts uh, do, uh, illustrated here. This is for generative modeling, and one is uh, for the animation nodes, the two add-ons for Blender, which I think is amazing that we have a, a Python API where you can already make your own node system to do this. But these are great experiments. You did one? Yeah. Which one? Ah, yeah, maybe I can't. So, so we, we should have it as a core feature built into Blender, right? Yeah, you can do C coding? Not yet. Not yet, good, next, next year, good. <laughs> Okay, the other topic, asset management and the whole pipeline thing. Um, we, we find it to be an increasingly big problem if we want to make stuff in Blender in our studio. But I think many people will find it increasingly difficult if you want to work with a little team or a group, do something bigger, uh, get all kinds of little issues and they get complicated and more complicated and you don't have it in control. Uh, so there is the dependencies on external files, uh, images, point caches. It's not visible, it's all hanging out somewhere, and then suddenly it disappears, and then it's back, and you don't know where they are. Uh, there's the matter of versioning, or levels. With level, I mean, you want to have a character in a low-poly version, a mid-poly, and high-poly. How do you manage that? We don't have nice tools for this. There's the whole linking and referencing, and you want to uh, share data between files, and you only reference them, but that's not always simple, and then you don't know if secretly something gets copied or not, and then you uh, lose a file, and then you lose your work, and those kind of things have to be solved too. There's uh, online reposit repositories. Uh, there's now add-ons which you can use to get your data from a web server. Uh, we should have that well working by uh, design inside of Blender. You should be able to connect online and get your assets from a server. And we, of course, inside of Blender, we need efficient browsing of and management of things. But we do have already something working in development. I mean, is, uh, Bastien is working on it. Bastien, there's Bastien. <laughs> we will talk about it. Uh, this is a view on a blend file, what? With all the data inside, including visualization of uh, objects. Very nice. Okay, the logic <laughs> system. So the current logic editor is like ancient. I remember I wrote it in the 90s, what? was nice, and we had to redo it very quickly when we had investor money in 2000, and that's it. And I, when I look back, open Blender, and I look at the logic editor, it's still the same, but it still didn't really change in 15 years. This is, of course, a compliment on, on one hand, but it's, <clears throat> it was not meant to be uh, living that long. 
so we have to remove it and replace it with something which has all the modern logic components and ideas and con concepts people know from other game engines or game creation tools. That is, which works with things like state, state engines and transitions, behavior, AI, all different concepts which you can make different editors for. And it's even more weird that there is already a paper from 2001 written by a guy who was working with me at that time to make the logic system. There's a whole design paper which you look at this, you know, waiting to hunting, the triggers. Look at this design, what? This is 15 years old. And he made this that back then. And this looks like something you want, almost. Huh? And it almost looks like, ah, here we have something that might look like a workable logic system. So he thought about it. So we should try to work on it. And moreover, we should make it work next to the animation system. But I don't think logic and animation has to differ that much. There's a lot of stuff which you want to have in the interface interactive anyway. Plus, once you have a logic system, and we have a viewport, and we have this amazing new physics and modifier system, you almost got a new game engine, right? And then you have a game engine which turns all of Blender into an interactive experience. What happens then? Okay, last topic, the interoperability. So Blender in non-open pipelines usually is not a very popular topic, or I usually say, yeah, I'm fine if Blender works in an open pipeline, because that's what we do. We make open source pipelines, right? The goal I showed this morning, a full creation tool in open source, uh, etc. But in daily practice, people are using Blender in non-open pipelines. And this is essential for workflow too. I don't think it will harm us to make sure that this, uh, this whole I.O. business, is part of the design of 2.8 from start. That in every part of a pipeline, in a production process, or in a studio, or in your own workflow, that you can say, okay, I love Blender, but I only want to do the texturing in Blender. Well, you should be able to simply put Blender in your texturing pipeline, and then go back and use the tools you like. Or if you look at things, uh, did people see the film with the garden gnome and the caterpillar? It was from Sasha Gudegebure. It's a very nice movie, it looks beautiful. What did the guys do? They used Maya for everything, and then they export it to FBX, load it into Blender, and then start shading, and send it to Cycles. So the whole first half of the pipeline is in Maya, and the last part is in Blender, which is perfect. It's a really good example, and we should help those people to make those things work. I mean, I know there are people here who, who work in studios, and who look at uh, pipelines or replacing parts of it, or using Blender for animation or only modeling, and we should be in contact with them because I want to have uh, a project working uh, where people also from studios become stakeholders. Because you cannot make me responsible for fitting Blender in your pipeline, because I don't know your pipeline. But you, you guys have to help us getting the design working and making sure we have the right format or the right uh, way of working that you can easily replace your Autodesk crap and put in Blender in your studio. <laughs> okay, so the how. <clears throat> I hope I have enough time. But... Oh shit. So I'm almost done. So uh, how are we going to do this? A couple of things. So we have a 2.8 branch. We're going to have it. It's not there yet. And that means uh, we can still keep working on 277, 278, 279, 9A, 9B, 9C, whatever it takes. But those are smaller updates where the current projects can go to. But we shouldn't make too much problems of that. We also should say, well, everything we want to solve in 2.8, we, we call it not fixable anymore in 2.7. Uh, otherwise, you have to keep fixing all the stuff 
while you wanted to work on something new. And we have to make radical decisions, on, especially on old code. Now, what are we going to kick out? As much as possible. The modifier system, the uh, constraints, the whole game managing, Blender internal, uh, what? You can name a list? And people are like, ah. <laughs> well, it doesn't mean that we stop having that functionality, but we want to push something better back. And if you want to, uh, what, what we tried to do for Gooseberry, to fix the hair system, and it brought us really far. I mean, it, uh, Gooseberry or Cosmic Laundromat looks amazing, but it's the end. It's really the last thing you can do with this uh, hair system. It's not the beginning. It's the, <coughs> the ultimate last thing, and it's a pain to use. So we should kick it out. I say, guys, you have a, a blender now, 2.8, and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't have a viewport, doesn't have a game engine, it doesn't have anything. <laughs> uh, that's perfect. It's like how I started 2.5. Do people remember the purple-green uh, interface? Well, that was a new interface toolkit without anything. And then we had one by one, we put things back, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but it was at least a good, fresh start. And I think that's maybe a model which we should use. And in parallel, I mean, people still have 2.7. It's not like that uh, we stop when they're still there. But if we want to make a big step, we have to prepare mentally to make a big step too. <clears throat> now, and also not be compatible. Sorry, I mean, I'm the biggest <laughs> compatibility uh, uh, how do you call it, evangelist ever. I hate incompatibility. But yeah, so sometimes you have to stop being compatible if you want to move on. So why not start? 2.8 with an incompatible hair system or physics system or modifier system. But we try to convert things and make scripts that ease the pain, but it might not be fully compatible. And uh, yeah, and lastly, let's spend time on our organizing ourselves better. So we have to empower people, stop discussing and get to work. Okay, some core principles to agree on. Uh, yeah, look at the 2.5 specs. Um, I mentioned the, the data structures and stuff. I mean, we can make Blender to survive like until 2020. That is when they have flying airplanes and stuff. Or flying cars, I mean, flying airplanes we have already. But uh, for the next five years, we can try to survive with this 2.8 project to make things work, keep it really work, but it's not the end. And there is a nice list of things you can add and call it a Blender 3.0. I know those things already, but uh, we don't talk about that now, right? Too much to do. And last or not least is it has to be fun. Using Blender has to be fun, but also coding in Blender has to be fun. So have everybody on board is important, that's why we're working. I want to have the whole core of the Blender developers involved, everybody who is on board. I mean, I really want their feedback. I say, yes, yes, this is good, a good idea, let's do it. Or, Tom, this is too ambitious, we can never make it. Now, then we cut half, we could make it simpler or smaller, but then we have to make it into something which people believe in, that they can do it. Now, and then, yeah, we need more people, and probably we have to be realistic. It is a full-time job. You can't have volunteers in the weekend, two hours and on a Saturday, expecting to do this whole thing. So we have to pay the bills. Uh, I can buy lottery tickets, maybe, or do a massive development fund campaign, or move to Kickstarter. That's our topic we can discuss. And that is enough for now. So we might have... So... Let's go eight minutes for people who have really, really, really good questions. Or oh, stupid questions, lots of fun. <laughs>